We are still under the governor's orders for doing uh, remote sessions. So we will continue to do that for the time being. And could we get a uh, roll call please, Rachel? Council member Kim Daughtry. Present, thank you. Thank you. Council member Joe Marine. I see you, but I don't quite hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Maureen. Uh, Council Member Jared Mead. Here. Thank you. Council Member Tom Merrill. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor John Nearing. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Labor Representative Lance Norton. I'm here. Thank you. Council member Sid Roberts. Here. Thank you. Council member Jan Schwedy. Here. Thank you. Mayor Nicola Smith. Present. Thank you. And council member Stephanie Wright is excused. Chair, we do have a quorum. I'll take alternate roll call briefly. Uh, council member Gallagher. Here. Thank you. Council member Christiana Johnson. Here. Oh, thank you. Mayor Matsumoto Wright. Here. Well, thank you. Uh, Council member James McNeil. And Council member Nate Nearing. Chair, that concludes roll. Hey, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is a public comment uh, for verbal comments. So you're supposed to sign up to speak by completing a sign up form on the, on the agenda. Advanced sign up is not required, but it's requested by 12 p.m. today. Uh, we do have one written comment that was received by the board provided in uh, our board packet. And I believe that uh, that was from Mr. Kunzler. I believe he is going to speak again today uh, during the public comments. So I would open it up to the public for speaking. Please raise your hand and we'll bring you in and you can, and you can uh, have your three minutes. Mr. Kunzler, you are here. Yes, I am, Mr. Chairman, whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Joe Kunzler here. I hope you read my written comments. Uh, I'm going to deal with the problem in the room so it's over and just say we don't need more conflict in the community over a parliamentary matter. Better to have a vote or table the board committee transparency issue than, and, and press on. I don't appreciate mixed signals of public to public transit allies about a strong transit agency. I know this is it strong. What I do appreciate is hopefully, the, and thank you, Rachel, for spotlighting me. Nicely, nicely done. Um, what I do appreciate is hopefully there is planning for a remote testimony to please continue whenever Proclamation 20 as 28 is repealed by Governor Inslee. That could happen any day now. And I hope this board will also ask staff and your lobbyists to please support House Bill 1329 passage by the state legislature. The bill provides for public access to public meetings more equitably after the pandemic or when the proclamation is repealed. What I also appreciate very much is community transit uh, posting to social media um, you know, notices, uh, social media meeting notices, that's a step in the right direction to get more inclusive voices. I hope I'm not the only one who appreciates this. I would like to see more community transit supporters be heard here. Uh, finally, as I explained in great detail in my letter to you, as a supporter of a friendly merger of community transit and effort transit, I want an integrated network. I also want voters to be presented with a plan how this will work long before the ballots arrive in the mail, most likely in, in November, in October, 2022. In October, 2022, a plan that includes an integrated transit network, a new governance structure and continuous improvement, not navigation, but joining two strong transit agencies. Uh, two, two June, 6.30 PM is to kick off at Everett City Hall. Most likely the meeting will stream online of the merger conversation. There is a lot that two agencies can teach each other like on zero emission buses. Furthermore, Board Member Norton was right in October 2019 when he said Ever Transit's finances were circling the drain. I would also add that Ever Transit could use the world famous Community Transit Help Desk with all their tech tools to help riders. And I'll stop there on an uplifting note, just thanking staff for all your hard work every single day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kunzler. I appreciate it. 
If anybody <coughs> else would like to make public comments, we ask you, you now use raise your hand feature under the participants button to indicate you would like to comment. If you've joined by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. Again, if anybody else would like to make a comment to the board, please raise your hand or use star nine if you're joined us by phone. I am not seeing anybody. Rachel, have you seen somebody I missed? Chair, I don't see anyone either. All right, then I'm going to close the public comment portion of today's board meeting. Next up on the agenda is an employee services award. Mr. Inglefritz, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, members of the board. It's good to see you all. Um, we have three employees we want to recognize today for service milestones. Um, I believe we have two of them joining us from the conference room at the Merrill Creek Operations Base. I think you can see them there on screen. Uh, Rocky Famboda and Peter Mikett. You guys can wave your hands. The board members can see you. Awesome. Um, Rocky is celebrating his 30 year anniversary with Community Transit, 30 years. Uh, during his time, three decades, he's worked as a coach operator, a dispatcher, and today he's a transportation supervisor. Rocky's known for his high quality of work and particularly his commitment to safety and for being a valuable resource on service planning and service area issues. Uh, he's received customer commendations over the years, uh, some of which have focused on his extraordinary efforts to help visually impaired and other disabled uh, customers, and also exhibiting courage in securing a bus that had rolled away. I, I doubt that was caught on YouTube, but I'm sure it was quite impressive. Uh, fun fact about Rocky, he enjoys walking his dog Debo early every morning. And I'm sure that's been an immense relief during this past year and a half. Uh, and I want to congratulate on behalf of the agency and the board to Rocky. We're lucky to have you here and not only here, but for 30 years. Congratulations. Um, secondly, Peter has been a coach operator for 25 years, sets a high standard on a daily basis. He's a valuable resource to his colleagues, and he's always willing to share his insights and viewpoints to help others. Over the years, he's received numerous accolades from customers. They've recognized Peter frequently for his kindness and professionalism. He's highly respected amongst his peers, fellow coach operators, dispatchers, supervisors, as well as management. Fun fact about Peter, he has been involved in the Community Transit Show and Shine Car Show over the past several years. I'm guessing we probably didn't get to have that one last year, but maybe we can have it later this year. Uh, he has shown a 1968 Ford Mustang Fastback, a 1966 Ford Fairlane GT390. And for those who don't know, that's a big block. That's a fast car. And a 2008 Ford Mustang. So obviously Peter is a Ford guy, so. I, I can only imagine, I, he can probably tell us how many times he's watched Ford versus Ferrari on, uh, on, on repeat. Uh, at any rate, Peter, thank you for your 25 years of service. We, we appreciate having you and look forward to seeing your cars again soon. And then last but not least, Jerry Spriggs joins us from the Zoom world. Uh, it looks like she's also at work, if I'm reading that background correctly. Okay, good to see you, Jerry. Jerry is celebrating 20 years uh, at Community Transit. She works in the transportation department as a business support specialist. Uh, and she's known as someone her colleagues can always count on to be the go-to person, not only for historical information, but to tackle any new challenge or project. Uh, she has implemented the trapeze sign-on terminals, which our coach operators and supervisors use every day. And she's currently focused on rolling out the trapeze um, clock in uh, functionality online so that our employees can bid their shifts uh, online and remotely. That's no small task. We're actually going to be piloting that for the first time this coming weekend. 
Um, there is not a lot that happens in the transportation department uh, that Jerry isn't part of. Her colleagues have shared that you can't move a piece of furniture without her knowing about it. So um, her colleague, Kathy Jackson, says of Jerry, quote, she's made a huge impact to our department, streamlining processes to make things easier and more efficient. Another colleague, Colleen Bowman, who's now retired, worked with Jerry for 16 years and sends her appreciation and says, Jerry's dedicated to the company, the department and the core values. She's a great asset and fun to work with. Uh, fun fact about Jerry, she enjoys camping in her fifth wheel with her husband, Brian, and her daughter, Finley, who will turn three in June. So big vehicles at work, big vehicles at home. I see, I see a pattern there. Congratulations, Jerry on your 20th anniversary. We're lucky to have you, thanks. And Mr. Chair, that concludes our employee recognitions. Thanks to all three of you for being here today and, and for your service to the organization. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we def definitely appreciate our staff and the many, many years that they have put into the organization. And it's always a, always a treat to have 20, 25, and 30 year employees be recognized at the board meetings. So thank you very much for your service. Uh, next on the agenda in our presentations would be the 2021 legislative session report. Uh, and Dabor Drasik is here. Dabor, you're on. Hear me? Locations today, so. Anyways, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good to see you, Kim. My name is Davor Jurassic. I am your uh, state lobbyist and have proudly represented you in Olympia since uh, 2000, back when uh, I had more hair and less weight. So, but I've uh, been with you guys a long time and uh, uh, always appreciate it. Um, what I was going to do today is just briefly uh, give you an overview of the 2021 legislative session and how community transit did. Uh, as a lot of you knew, know, this was kind of a, a historic session um, with it being uh, um, because of COVID uh, being a virtual session. Uh, very few legislators and staff were actually on the Capitol campus with a uh, majority of both uh, remaining at home uh, or their home offices. So uh, the folks that were actually in Olympia uh, were leadership and uh, folks that were actually running the day-to-day -day operations of the legislature um, and everyone else was, uh, was at home uh, via Zoom uh, or uh, Microsoft Teams and uh, that made it for a quite uh, an interesting legislative session. Uh, the good news is, though, I think uh, as far as uh, the public was concerned and everyone else, I think it went very well uh, um, technology-wise, and uh, it'll be interesting to see in the future if uh, more and more people uh, choose not to come to Olympia if there's the option of uh, being able to uh, do this over the internet, especially people that would have to travel quite some distances. Um, the good news is the session wrapped up on time, uh, the 105th day, uh, which was the final day, uh, April 25th, about 10 minutes after six, the legislature concluded. Uh, they were able to do uh, their primary business and that is passing the budgets, the state operating budgets, the capital budget and the transportation budget. Uh, one piece of business, uh, that was pertinent to us and a whole bunch of other folks that they were not able to do was pass a new uh, transportation revenue package. And uh, we'll talk more about that uh, in just a while, um, in just a bit. But um, the, uh, the virtual session led to a lot less bills being introduced and passed. Uh, there were a total of 335 bills that actually made it out of the legislature and in front of the governor, uh, governor's office to be signed into law. Um, in prior long sessions, um, 2019, there were 481 bills versus the 335 that were passed. So quite a, quite a dip in the bills. 
but uh, a virtual session means that uh, you can only do so much um, uh, as you would as in person. Uh, although there were a lot fewer bills, there were some very big issues uh, that passed this session. There were uh, multiple, I think there were 11 pieces of legislation dealing with uh, policing reform that will change that profession uh, uh, quite a bit. And there were also quite a few uh, social equity bills, a couple of uh, climate bills that the, the governor had been working on since his uh, first, first term in office that passed. Uh, there was a capital gains tax. Some folks call it an income tax, but uh, it's li listed as a capital gains tax. That one has been uh, in the legislature for a couple of decades, and that actually did pass. And then there, uh, one other item uh, that I noted was there were an awful lot of uh, bills and funding dealing with broad broadband for uh, communities. So in the in the virtual world. Uh, we, we all realize you know, there's a lot of communities out there that do, do not have sufficient broadband and we are relying upon it a lot more. So uh, that was one of the major uh, focuses. Uh, regarding transportation uh, in general and public, public transit, there was noted, notably very, very few bills this session, very few policy bills. Um, and uh, a lot of the, the House and Senate uh, transportation committees were actually uh, canceled because of the lack of uh, pieces of legislation that were introduced uh, and, and only a handful actually passed. And as I had mentioned earlier, the main focus was on a new revenue package. And that's where uh, the House and the Senate transportation committees spent most of their time. Um, on page one of my report, about halfway down the page, um, community transit's uh, primary focus or areas of focus for this last session were twofold. One was uh, funding for continued SWIFT network build out. All of you know that we have a very successful um, SWIFT bus rapid transit uh, network and our main focus uh, in the past and for many years in the future is to continue to build that out in Snohomish County. And so we focused in on that and uh, retaining uh, funding that we had been, uh, that we had gained in the legislature and also future funding. Uh, and our other area was, uh, uh, and one that a lot of uh, associations and entities always bring forward is, is we didn't want to see any uh, harm done to public transit. And that can come in a variety of different shapes and forms. Normally, you know, um, uh, they come in the, the form of unfunded mandates, new, uh, new procedures, new policies that we need to implement, but they don't come with the funding. And then also uh, specifically for this session, since uh, the transportation budget, the, the current revenue transportation budget was not very healthy. Uh, in the end, they called it a maintenance budget uh, due to COVID and the lack of uh, funding that has come in there from gas tax, ferry fares, and tolls. We wanted to make sure that uh, that community transit, that public transit, and community transit specifically, uh, that there was no harm to us uh, financially. And I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, both objectives were achieved this session. Um, which is good news. Uh, public transit fared very well. They did not go backwards and neither did community transit. And I can't say the same for other entities that are reliant upon transportation funds. So I think we're, uh, we're very happy with the outcomes. So what some of those outcomes were, um, we talked about funding uh, retained and secured and uh, the focus around our SWIFT bus network, uh, kind of the bottom of page one on our SWIFT green line, uh, we were able to uh, secure the second half, second five million of our $10 million regional mobility grant for our green line that we received last biennium. Uh, last biennium uh, in 2019-21, we received uh, 5 million and now we're gonna receive the additional five, 5 million this coming biennium. 
that starts uh, July 1st, 2021. Uh, just noted that this last time around, this was the number one rated project by the Washington State Department of Transportation under the regional mobility grants. So we're real proud of that. Um, if, if you folks remember back in 2015 was the last time there was a new revenue uh, transportation package called Connecting Washington. In that package, we secured uh, $10 million for, for use of our uh, Swift Bus Rapid Transit. Um, the funding had been pushed out a little, but now we'll start, um, start this coming biennium. And you can see the breakdown of the $10 million over four bienniums, and that can be used for operating or capital and uh, just a little over uh, $2 million uh, each biennium. So we're real happy that uh, that actually is gonna start happening. Something, something that we secured way back in 2015 and uh, those funds are gonna start flowing this, this coming biennium. And then when we were fortunate enough also to get some new uh, funding from the Regional Mobility Grant Program, uh, just over 3.7 million in two bienniums and, uh, and we dropped, we did just a little with this program or this project. We were only ranked number two uh, from WashDOT for our regional mobility grant. So uh, you kind of see a theme here. We do really well and have the correct type of projects that fit into regional mobility grants. And, uh, and that is helping us with our SWIFT uh, bus build out. Um, just touching on the new transportation revenue uh, packages. Uh, there were two of them this year, one in the House, one in the Senate. In the House, uh, the package was named Miles Ahead Washington. And in the end, it was about $22 billion of, uh, of projects and revenue over 16 years. And in the Senate, uh, Senator, uh, our own Senator Steve Hobbs uh, had his his forward Washington transportation package that he's had. This will be the third session. And um, in the end, there was about 18 billion over 16 years. Uh, unfortunately, neither one of those or a, a, a negotiated uh, new revenue package did not make it all the way through the session. Uh, the good news is though that in those packages, community transit, uh, did very well. There were three projects that we got our three, three of our local legislators to sponsor for us. Each of them were $10 million uh, total. One was for a green line extension. One was funding towards our gold line and the other was uh, the silver line, uh, line, silver, silver line bus rapid transit line from Seaway Transit Center to Mill, Mill Creek. Um, so, like I said, the, the good news is that uh, in those packages, we did receive specific community transit funding, and there was a whole bunch of funding uh, for public transit in general that we could go after uh, over those 16 years, like regional mobility grants, uh, green, green grants, and a couple of others. But uh, unfortunately, that package did not, uh, did not pass. Uh, even with the uh, outstanding uh, testimony by our own uh, uh, CEO who, uh, who testified a couple times on those packages. And, um, but uh, that will be uh, part of our focus and a lot of other folks focus this interim, uh, trying to get that, that going in the future. So that's kind of from the funding as aspect of it. I'll just briefly go over uh, uh, less than a handful of bills that actually made it through the legislative session that, uh, that we were interested in, uh, primarily the first one dealing with van pools. As a lot of you guys know, uh, people were not going to work, therefore they did not need um, the use of the van pools. So we have a lot of van pool vans that are sitting dormant on our properties. And uh, it was the primary objective to get get them going again and looking for different uses uh, were allowing us to use them differently than current law. 
So the Washington State Transit Association with input from us and several other transits uh, brought forward legislation that, that did pass. This was uh, our one and only piece of legislation that we uh, as an association uh, stood behind and brought forward. Uh, and basically what it, what it did, um, it lowered the number of individuals that you need to actually conduct a van pool. So it went from five persons, including the driver, to three persons, and uh, there were other, a lot of other requirements that were, that were dropped or waived, and uh, there's going to be an ongoing study of, you know, how, how can we best use these vans. So more to come on that, but the good news is um, we're able to, we will be able to, when this bill is signed into law, we'll be able to um, use our van pool vans uh, outside of the current uh, um, guidelines that are there. There's one piece of uh, legislation regarding sound transit that passed. I will note that this was not a piece of legislation brought forward by sound transit, but was something that they were working on with their uh, constituents. And I think they were in the first year of a two year process and uh, some folks uh, decided they wanted to go ahead and pass legislation. But this, this was for expanding uh, options for fair enforcement. Uh, and this only, this piece of legislation only relates to a, a regional transit authority, an RTA, uh, and there's only one of those in the state. We are a PTBA, Public Transportation Benefit Agency or area, and uh, that is the, the largest uh, classification for transit agencies. And uh, this law does not affect us in our fair um, enforcement but we're going to be taking, uh, we're going to be watching how it is implemented. Is it going to achieve what the proponents wanted it to? And, and are there things, uh, if if it does work, and uh, is there things that we like, and then we as a PTBA could go back next year or the year after and say, yeah, we would like to change our RCWs um, to allow us to do that. Also, we're, we're a different animal than they are different type of agency, different laws, different mission, but uh, we all have fair enforcement issues at some point in time. So that was a bill that was passed. And then the last two, just real briefly, were uh, two bills that uh, Governor Inslee has been a proponent of for, uh, I, I don't know how many years, uh, a long time. And uh, one deals with the low carbon fuel standard that did pass and the other was uh, a cap and invest uh, prior known as a cap and trade bill. And uh, both of them deal with lowering carbon emissions. Um, and one thing of note for both of these bills, um, specifically the cap and invest bill, but both of them have the caveat that if a new transportation revenue package is not passed by January 1st, 2023, then these bills, um, the implementation of parts of these bills are null and void. So that, that is, I think, one way they were able to get these bills passed this session without a new revenue package, because specifically in the cap and invest bill, there would be hundreds of millions of dollars uh, going towards a new transportation revenue package. Um, so that puts the, the pressure on the legislature to try to pass a new package before uh, January 1st of 2023. So I will stop there. And, and that was just a, a brief inter, uh, overview of what happened. Uh, I will say that uh, um, I'm very happy of how the session came out. There were a lot of unknowns, but uh, the one thing that we do know is that we were able to uh, have a very successful session and uh, retain our funding and uh, acquire additional funding for SWIFT, for our SWIFT bus. Thank you, Devor. Does anybody on the board have any questions for Devor? I'm hearing crickets. Hmm. I got to turn the volume down. That's pretty loud. Um, 
Thank you very much, Devorah. You've always done an outstanding job in your reports to the board every year. I really appreciate your work with the uh, with what with the community transit down in Olympia. Uh, I've been down there several times and seen you in there shaking hands and making things happen. Uh, and so it's always impressive to see your work. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, you're always sneaking up on me down there. I know. <laughs> I'm a little guy. You're a big guy. It's easy for me to sneak up. Okay, so uh, if there's no more questions for DeVore, then we'll move on to another presentation on the Swiss Bus Rapid Transit Program update with Melissa Colley and June Duvall. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you. Thank you for having us today. Um, I don't know if anyone has developed this, but I've developed this bad habit in Zoom meetings of clicking a pen. So I've moved all the pens out of uh, my way so that I won't annoy you doing that, working on that. So uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Daughtry, uh, to uh, let me have some time to talk about SWIFT. If you'll go to the next slide, Rachel. So I think you've seen this slide before. It's just a good sort of snapshot of where we're at in the build out of our SWIFT network. Uh, I can't believe that in November of this year, the Swift Blue Line will be 12 years old. It was, you know, our first BRT line that we launched in 2009, serving uh, the Everett Regional Growth Center and then traveling down uh, Evergreen 99 to Aurora Transit Center. And then in 2019, uh, getting to launch the Swift Green Line that serves Bothell Canyon Park Regional Center and then the Boeing Paint Field. Uh, you heard DeVore talk about our regional mobility money, and that is for operating. So sometimes uh, uh, one of the things that we look at when we're launching a new line is the opportunity to get some operating assistance to grow the ridership on that. So uh, we secured $10 million for operating uh, of the Swift Green Line, and so we'll be uh, tapping into that second biennium of money. So that's excellent. We are working on closing this project out. So the capital portion, we're hoping to be closed out, procurements, uh, everything done in June. And then you'll remember that this was our agency's first capital investment grant, that $43 million, the largest uh, grant that we had ever received as an agency. And we're looking to close that grant out um, third quarter of uh, this year. And then moving on to uh, where we're at uh, right now, Swift Orange Line and Swift Blue Line expansion. So we are working on design and engineering, just ending uh, that process uh, probably this summer. We'll be coming back to the board later this year to talk to you about our construction plans. And so exciting because this will be uh, the first BRT to light rail connection that Snohomish County will be getting in 2024. And then we are also at the same time working on Swift Blue Line expansion. So we are currently in design and engineer on that process. Uh, and once again, serving that 185th Street station and shoreline to be ready for light rail when it comes in 2024. You will see later this year in our budget proposals that we're going to ask for some scoping study money to begin looking at the alignment for Swift Gold Line. So that will be really exciting getting out to serve the newly formed Cascade Industrial Manufacturing and Industrial Center. And then uh, you hear, we hear a lot, when is Green Line expansion happen? When is Silver Line happening? And you heard uh, DeVore talk about that in our uh, ask for a potential new transportation revenue package. And the simple answer for that is, you know, right now we're working with our jurisdictional partners and there are some development things that need to happen, some infrastructure improvements need, need to happen in order for those corridors to be ready to support BRT. So we're monitoring those. And when we feel like that's appropriate, we will begin the process of those two lines as well. Next slide. So some good statistics for uh, how we did in 2020, we call it our pandemic performance. Uh, SWIFT accounted for about 30% of our total system, uh, uh, directly operated system boardings. Yeah, and we find that to be uh, really incredible, about 2 million passenger boardings in 2020. And it was very heartening for us as an agency to see that even in a pandemic, uh, customers really were utilizing our SWIFT service. You can see the breakdown there between uh, the Swift Blue Line and the Swift Green Line. The Swift Blue Line is still our highest ridership route. 
you know, that swift green line is going to start coming into its own. You know, we, we opened in 2019. It didn't even get, you know, almost a full year before we went into pandemic. So we will be excited to see that ridership continue to grow. Next. So uh, I wanted to just give you the latest on where we're at on Orange Line and just a little recap for folks. Um, you know, this is an 11 mile corridor. Uh, hitting some really important key areas in uh, Snohomish County. So the Mill Creek Town Center, Alderwood Mall, Edmonds College, and Linwood Transit Center, and then connecting to the right light rail there, uh, Link Light Rail in Linwood. The project includes uh, 15 new buses. Uh, you'll remember uh, at Edmonds College that we currently serve a transit loop there, and the college has really wanted to get us out of that loop for quite a while because they want to repurpose it for much needed parking. So it's a win-win for our agencies that we will be coming out of that transit loop and we will be building a beautiful uh, transit center out on 68th in front of the college uh, that will serve uh, local service and will serve our, our SWIFT BRT Orange Line. We'll be redesigning uh, the transit center at McCollum Park and Ride to accommodate uh, the Orange Line. There'll be 13 stations in each direction along the corridor and then looking for opportunities for speed and reliability infrastructure improvements. Next. I think it was maybe a, a little bit over a month ago that the exciting news came out that we had been awarded uh, capital investment grant funds, so 37 million. And some of you I'm sure are saying, now, wait a minute, I thought last time you came and talked to us, you said you had to be rated in a report. We didn't see that and you're correct. So this is a bit of a, uh, an anomaly on how this happened. Usually the process is that the annual report comes out and it recommends an agency for funding and it rates the project and then you're appropriated. What happened for us was there was some money available in fiscal year 21 to allocate for projects uh, in the capital investment grant program and our regional office uh, having a high level of confidence uh, in our agency recommended that we get our funding uh, and then we will still be waiting to see that rating. What I wanted the board to know is that uh, that vote of confidence uh, really is an agency and board shared compliment that the reputation of our agency is so strong that they're willing to appropriate us our money early. Uh, and um, so we were we were just thrilled with that news. There are some regulatory requirements in this uh, grant program that are different than other programs. Uh, they give substantial amounts of money to agencies. And so you can see that there's much more due diligence done in this program. And one of those uh, uh, oversight, those regulatory requirements is called the PMOC process. So FTA hires a project management over oversight consultant and they come in and really look at your project from all the different angles, looking at the scope and the cost and the schedule. They look at our plans and documents. They make sure that we as staff have the cap capacity and capability to do the project, and then they sign off on it. So we are still in that process, um, and we will need to complete that process before we would be eligible to actually execute the grant. Next slide. One of the things that we're really proud about uh, the Swift Orange Line project is the funding package that we've put together. We looked at other uh, federal programs and state programs to um, augment uh, this project. You can see the $37 million that we got from the CIG program, and then all the different forms of funding that we got for different pieces of this project. The $5 million that you see under the state funding is actually that uh, those first two bienniums of the Connecting Washington money that we'll be using on the Orange Line project. And altogether, we think we're going to be around an 80 to $82 million uh, project. $63 million of that will be paid for with state and federal funding. So it's exciting to have that level of support from our state and federal agencies. Next slide. So there's been a few changes that I wanted to share with you since I think the last time we talked. You'll remember that uh, many of you have uh, seen a swift orange line uh, map that showed us not actually going into Linwood Transit Center. It showed us building a, a station out on 244th. And that was our original proposal. And in the negotiation process with FTA, as we were going through the rating submittal process, 
in order to achieve some of the thresholds in ridership that the FTA wanted from us, we uh, needed to make an adjustment and that um, resulted in us realigning uh, into Linwood Transit Center. So we will actually be going into the transit loop and, uh, and building some Swift stations in there and serving uh, actually into LTC. I want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Mayor Smith because uh, you can imagine we came back to her staff as well as Sound Transit staff and said, yeah, I know we said we weren't coming into the transit center, but now we are. And everyone has been uh, really accommodating to help us get to yes. And it just shows the great support we have for this project. Next slide. So I just wanted to show you uh, a couple drafts, uh, some images, pictures, a thousand words to see what we're uh, gonna be doing at LTC. So we uh, have figured out where we're going to be in the transit center. You know, there's substantial infrastructure at uh, Linwood Transit Center if you haven't been there. And one of the things that we wanted to, uh, some goals for us going into LTC was, first of all, to be good stewards of funds and also to look at the pretty significant infrastructure there. It didn't feel good to tear everything out and build a SWIFT station and have something there that would be less infrastructure than what our customers uh, are used to right now. So, uh, Rachel, if you go to the next slide, we're working on what we call swiffing up LTC. So we'll be working within uh, the existing footprint. And the goals were to really make sure that, um, you know, we maintain those iconic pieces of SWIFT that were really identifiable. So you can see the iconic marker there at the end. And then getting that blue in there on the columns. Um, Lidwood Transit Center is pretty gray in scale. So we wanted to really make sure that the blue SWIFT stations were able to be seen uh, and then uh, making it uh, really visual from uh, the light rail platform when folks get off. If you just do the next slide, Rachel, this is just maybe a little better uh, idea on the opposite, opposite side of what that looks like. So we're working through uh, getting through the design, uh, final design process on that. But all in all, it's been a really good uh, opportunity for our agency. Next slide. So the other thing uh, that we have been working on um, is redesigning uh, our stations, our SWIFT stations. So, you know, building that, that first line in 2009 and then the green line in 2019, uh, we wanted to, you know, be able to obviously go back and look at, are there opportunities for improvement? Are there things that have changed, things that uh, don't make sense that we could be updating? And Christopher Silvera, who is our uh, phenomenal BRT program manager, uh, worked on this effort. It was really uh, a well-integrated effort within our agency, getting uh, input from a lot of different stakeholders. And really, the goal of this project was to address uh, our customer needs. So we looked at things like overhead rain protection, some better lighting, improving the signage, uh, seating that was more usable, and then easier fare payment and customer information. So you can see now that the, the windscreens in the back of the station is a little farther out and that roof is coming out to provide um, some more protection for uh, our customers. I'm really excited about uh, some of the passenger information signs that are gonna go up at the station. I really feel like it's gonna be a real good user experience. Uh, so we've been really pleased with that. We recently went out to the Swift station that is at the admin building and we mocked up some of these things. So people caught to come in and actually sit on some seats and see what they thought. And we got really good information to get that final design completed and approved by our steering committee. Next slide. So just real quick, uh, where are we at on Orange Line? Um, we completed our NEPA last year. We're moving past 90% design and getting closer to that 100% design threshold and then uh, completing interlocal agreements with the cities of Linwood and Mill Creek. So the next steps are we're really wanting to see that rating come out in the annual report. It corresponds with the president's budget. So uh, the first year of a presidency, some of those, uh, that first year budget sometimes lagging. So we're hoping to see it anytime. It'll be late breaking news. You'll know when we know. We wanna complete all those regulatory requirements that I was talking about. So completing the PMOC process, we have interlocal agreements that we need to complete. Um, and then we do a little piece of NEPA, a little bit more environmental work because of that change at LTC. 
And then lastly, executing uh, the grant. The other thing that we're working on right now is property acquisition. And you'll remember last September, you approved us the opportunity to begin the property acquisition piece. And at the end of my presentation, June's just gonna give you a little bit more information about how that uh, right of way property acquisition process works. Next, please. So then moving into Swift Blue Line, uh, just a reminder about this project, we'll be extending from Aurora Transit Center about 1.7 miles. And currently the preferred extension for that alternative is to continue to serve the transit center and route out to a Meridian Avenue, and then eventually to the 185th Street Sound Transit light rail station. We have phased this project into two phases. So the first phase uh, that we are currently working on will be purchasing expansion buses to provide that expanded service. We'll be building two SWIFT stations at the 185th Street uh, light rail station, wayfinding, and then speed and reliability improvements. So things like a transit signal priority, uh, bat lanes, those sort of things, um, predominantly outside of the city of Everett. With everything that's going on between the two agencies, we're going to wait and see how that all shakes out. And then we'll look at doing phase two, which would look at speed and reliability improvements and potentially new stations within the city of Everett. Next. So some milestones. Uh, last year, we completed our scoping report. And then you heard DeVore talk about some of our funding. So $3.2 million of federal funding for buses, and then that $3.7 million of regional mobility for phase one construction. And we've kicked off our design process with KPFF earlier this year. So next steps will be to continue to coordinate with our jurisdictional partners regarding design and engineering, and then a coordination effort between city of Shoreline and community transit on the outreach of this project. Next slide. And then next year, uh, we'll be, like I said, asking for some funding to begin the scoping study uh, on, on Gold Line. Um, so that'll be really exciting to get that work started. In 2024, uh, we will be serving all of the regional growth centers in Snohomish County, except the CIG, uh, the newly formed Cascade Industrial Center. Uh, we'll look to get that served by 2027 with the SWIFT Gold Line. But in 2024, we're estimating to have about 14,000 weekday boardings on our SWIFT network. So very excited um, and really pleased as things are gonna progress. And so I'm gonna turn over this next piece to June uh, Duvall, who has uh, continued to work on our right of way. We've been really happy to have her continue to be the lead on that. And she'll just uh, share some information and walk you through a few things. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, board members. Um, very quickly, wanted to give you a status update on the right-of-way acquisition. You approved this resolution last September, and so we've proceeded to do the appraisals and make offers. All told, there are 17 individual properties plus two governmental partners at the two terminus. Snohomish County Parks on the east side and Edmonds Community College on the west side. When I talk about properties though, I wanted to kind of walk through what that means. We're not taking an entire property, but sometimes it's just a little sliver of land. And in this graphic, you can see it's, it's I, I recognize it's hard to see, but it's kind of color coded as to what we're going to build. So the blue that you can see where the Swift stations would be, sometimes they jut over into the adjoining property owner. So we would purchase that as an easement. At times we've purchased as small as a 10 by 10 square in order to plant a signal pole. Sometimes it's much bigger than that. We always try to site the stations as much in public right away as we can, but there are sometimes some property takes that or uh, property easements that we need to get. So all told at this moment, we have nine of our total properties are settled. We've reached agreement and we've closed or started an escrow. There are eight remaining properties that are in active negotiations. There are two that are a little bit off cycle due to us moving station locations in order to minimize some impacts. So those two will lag a little bit, but they'll come online at the same time as the project. We're moving forward on those. Right now, our next steps are is we were, go we're going to work towards final offers in the next week or two. 
then we would come back to the board at a future date if additional action is needed in order to obtain the right of way. So everything is progressing. We're on a good path. And if any further action is needed, we'll come to a further board and to discuss that. And with that, I'll turn the presentation back over to the board chair. Thank you, June. It's nice to see you again. Thank you, Melissa. Very nice. Um, for the board, do you have any questions for either Melissa or June? Uh, go ahead, Jen. Yeah, I just have a quick one. As you're doing the uh, acquisitions, are you finding that the price of the land in just the last year, year and a half has gone up drastically? We are seeing a slight increase. Um, uh, uh, several of the property owners have come back to us in our appraisals being done last year and then what they're seeing in their tax assessments this year. But it's um, in general, it's about three to four percent, and which is is fairly easy to settle with them on. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Anything else, uh, Melissa? On the uh, PMOC, do we uh, provide any infrastructure for that, or is they are they working out of their own offices, or or what? Uh, yeah, well, because of COVID, uh, we're doing it all virtually. When we did it on the Green Line, they actually flew in from places. And so we would be in the board conference room or we'd be in the planning conference room. This has all been done by Zoom. So a little more challenging. You know, we provide all the documents, you know, through a link and they're able to go in and access uh, things through the media file. But a little, di a little different process and a different PMOC as well than we had on Green Line. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for either June or Melissa? Okay, seeing none, I guess we'll move on. Thank you very much for the presentation, ladies. Very well done. Uh, next on the agenda is wireless program overview. And uh, Director uh, Crowbuck is going to introduce his person for this presentation. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go okay, ahead. Great, good afternoon. I wanted to give you a quick status today on a longstanding project uh, we've had in the, going on in the background for a number of years uh, to replace our aging uh, radio system. Pretty important project, uh, got delayed here and there for various reasons. Jay Heim, our, our program manager in our IT organization is gonna give you, present the project itself, it was very, very successful. Uh, and I hope you're pleased with the results because we certainly are uh, operationally. So Jake, go ahead. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you board for having us today. Rachel, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this will be a brief presentation intended to provide a high level context for item 7C on your consent agenda today. Uh, we're gonna cover a little bit of information about the communications platform itself. Uh, we'll talk about our switch from radio over to cellular. Um, I will touch on the value for investment and some of the benefits that we've reaped uh, internal to our agency, as well as some regional partner benefits as part of completing this project and then our immediate next steps. Next slide. So as Tim mentioned, this is a, a communications platform. Uh, and as you know, communication systems are really critical for operator to dispatch communication. Uh, they must work at all times, otherwise we are flying blind. Uh, our old radio system was end of life at 20 plus years old, so we got some pretty good use out of that. Uh, some limitations that came along with this technology include coverage and voice quality. Uh, we had some spotty areas and uh, this was somewhat impacted by weather, believe it or not. Um, so we uh, put together a project proposal that was approved in 2012 for funding in 2013 and identified a funding plan of 26 million to modernize our radio system. Um, however, technology changes fast, as I'm sure you're all aware, and cellular had become increasingly viable. So we wanted to take a look at what cellular providers could uh, offer us in the area and see if that was a viable alternative. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, we uh, embarked on a cellular coverage test to understand what uh, our partners could provide. So what you see here 
is a uh, cellular test for the Verizon network. Um, green is good. And as you can see, there is a lot of green on the map. Uh, so we made a decision to move off of radio and onto this cellular network uh, based on this coverage testing, some improved features that we had, uh, cost and overall reliability. Next slide. In terms of value for investment, as I mentioned, we had, we had identified uh, $26 million um, potentially for this capital investment. Uh, but what we ended up with was a $13 million capital uh, investment that really achieved greater quality and higher performance with this new voice communication system, um, improved operational efficiencies, more reliability, and better scalability uh, for future technologies. Next slide. So some of these program benefits, we reduced the capital cost by 50%, which is pretty tremendous. Uh, in addition to that, we reduced yearly operational costs from almost 1 million per year on the old radio system to just a little bit under 400K. Uh, we introduced some enhanced dispatch capabilities, making the ease of use for operators significantly better. Uh, we also achieved priority status with Verizon, which was a kind of an innovative classification for us to ensure that our communication would be at the same level as emergency responders uh, in the event of a disaster. And we set up our NG Orca project, um, as well as future prod products on a more modern platform that allowed for better reliability and scalability. Next slide. So some of these operational benefits, uh, we engaged with operations staff early and often throughout this process to really develop a system uh, that was designed by the user for the user. Uh, it's part of the reason this was so successful. Uh, we also were able to increase our security and safety measures with a new emergency alarm listen-in function so that we could assess situations in the field as they were happening. Uh, we have exceptional call quality now that is not impacted by weather. We often hear from coach operators that it sounds like dispatch is in the coach with them, which is the best outcome that we could have for a communications platform. And uh, the system was extremely easy to implement due to our uh, combo radio system and voice communication system upgrade um, operating side by side so we could transition into this new platform very easily. Next slide. Uh, we also engaged with our regional partners very early and often as well. Um, some of the folks that you see on the slide here were part of a regional advisory council that we went back to to help uh, design the solution and uh, keep them up to speed as we progressed. Next slide, Rachel. Uh, in addition to the benefits that we were able to provide with the agency, uh, we also are potentially able to provide some community benefits. Um, what you see on the, on the slide here are some examples of some of the uh, opportunities for us to provide benefit through uh, some of our decommissioned assets or assets that will become decommissioned very soon here. Um, and per the consent agenda item 7C, uh, we have a memo requesting authority uh, be provided to the CEO to decommission or transfer assets as is most beneficial to us and the region. Next slide. Um, as Tim mentioned, this is a very long project. This really started in earnest in 2015. Um, and incorporated a number of milestones here through research and due diligence, some procurement and system testing, installation and system preparation in the year that shall not be named, 2020. Uh, and then we finally went live in early 2021 um, with a, a phased approach to roll this into operations uh, and had some really excellent results uh, pretty much out of the gate. So where we are now is just in advance of our last portion of this program. Uh, where we will decommission the old radio system um, and transfer assets again, provided that we receive approval as is most advantageous for the agency. I also wanna provide a special shout out to Elena Petrova and Richard Staub for sticking with it throughout the course of this project. Um, without their direct support, this would have been an extremely difficult project to finish uh, and very much appreciate their tenacity and stick with itness uh, to get us to where we are today. So thank you for your time and I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Jay, I appreciate it. And I appreciate your team's effort um, on behalf of the board. We thank everybody that's been involved in this. It has been a long process. I've been here for almost all of it. Uh, I know that uh, Mr. Nering has been involved in uh, several portions of this for several years uh, with his uh, work on the other agencies. 
And uh, I think it's going to be real impressive. I'm really glad that uh, it came out of the box so easily. Right? So well, not, not easily, so well. I guess it wasn't easy at all. No, <laughs> it was not. Uh, it sounds like we're, we're doing really well. Uh, does any of the other board members have any comments or questions for Jay or Tim? John? Let me just add. Oh, go ahead. Oh, just really good job. Yeah, this has been a, uh, quite a quite a process. And Tim, I know, and his team have just done phenomenal work. So thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It, like anything big, uh, John and chair and board, you know, a number of departments, Steve's maintenance department, Jerry's training department, and obviously the dispatch and coach operators were key in making this happen. Uh, we, went, we went through a lot of hoops and jumps, uh, but we got there and had, uh, we have even better operational results than we expected. So um, sometimes good things take a long time and this was one of those. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Tim and Jay again. If there's no other questions for either, then we will move on to the chief executive officer's report. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you to the board members um, for your patience and, and uh, attentiveness through those presentations. They just, you know, taken as a whole, it shows what this agency has been doing over the past year and a half and the fact that we really haven't let up despite uh, a lot of adverse conditions. And I just think it speaks to the integrity and the resilience of the employees, um, their adaptability to be able to adjust uh, and keep things moving uh, while delivering the service every day. And, and so I, I really just uh, wanna shout out the employees for keeping things going and, and keeping them going robustly and successfully. Um, so um, I need to begin today with some sad news. Uh, some of you have already heard but the night before last, uh, one of our coach operators passed away unexpectedly uh, outside of work. Um, this has come as a shock uh, to our employees uh, as the person in question was quite well known. Uh, Steve Kim and Cesar Portillo and their teams have been actively engaged with our employees and with the family over the last couple of days, helping support them uh, through this. It's really an unexpected tragedy um, out of respect, I don't have much more to share than that by way of details. I just wanted you to know that this happened and the organization is working through some, some grief right now. So um, if you can keep the employees in your thoughts, uh, I'd appreciate it. And I know you always do. Um, so shifting uh, into my report, um, I, we did a deep dive on COVID during the workshop. Um, couple of weeks ago, so I'm not gonna delve too far into the metrics today. Uh, I do have a couple things I wanted to highlight. Um, number one, with respect to cases, we're over two weeks past our most recent case. Our last positive case uh, was April 19th, and that was outside the uh, workplace. So, so far so good, knock on wood. Um, we haven't seen anything since then after a brief blip. Um, earlier in the month in March. Um, in terms of vaccinations, we're joining a number of our partner agencies in, in putting on a full court press uh, to promote and encourage people to take advantage of the opportunity to get vaccinated. Um, we're supporting the operation, as you know, of the Ashway Park and Ride, uh, which is accommodating walk up uh, or drive through vaccinations now with no appointments needed. And that facility, uh, for those who may be listening out there, is open uh, 10 to 5 every day. And uh, no appointments are required, in fact, at any of the Snohomish County mass vaccination sites. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for our employees and everybody else to avail themselves of this opportunity. Um, we've asked our employees to share with us voluntarily uh, when they do get vaccinated so we can track uh, the progress we're making. And you know, our numbers are roughly in line with the, the countywide numbers. So we're making steady progress. It's slowed a bit, um, but we are strongly and regularly encouraging employees to get vaccinated 
and working hard to answer people's questions um, to make sure they know where the opportunities are to get vaccinated, uh, to remove barriers as much as possible. Um, you know, we're continuing to provide COVID leave if necessary for folks to, to get out and, and, and make that appointment and get that done. Um, we are communicating regularly across multiple channels, often uh, multiple times a week, and we're continuously exploring and discussing other ways um, to encourage folks to, to take advantage of the opportunity. I personally got my second dose this past Monday and um, I'm commuting, co communicating uh, regularly and personally to folks who are able uh, to, to get vaccinated if they can. Um, related to this, uh, uh, moving to premium pay, as I shared last week, I decided to extend premium pay uh, to May 15th. Uh, we're keeping a very close eye on the county stats uh, and the information coming from the state, including vaccination rates. Um, you know, there was a lot of speculation uh, last week as to whether our county and some of our neighboring counties might slide back into phase two. Uh, so I thought it was the right thing to do to, uh, to keep a premium pay in place. Uh, we're going to be looking at this uh, on a week by week basis. The governor um, has essentially uh, moved to a biweekly review of the case data, and we expect him to speak to this issue again next week. So, so that's where we are. I, I've also been communicating that you know premium pay is is going to phase out eventually. Uh, it never was meant to last indefinitely. Uh, I'm proud we've been able to provide this as a recommendation, or excuse me, as a as a recognition uh, of the employees' uh, continued commitment to providing the service through the pandemic. Um, so it's been an important part of our toolkit. So uh, we will revisit this issue again uh, within the next couple of weeks. Um, and in the meantime, continue urging everybody to, to uh, do their part in terms of public health, in terms of vaccination, to try to help the community move uh, toward and into phase four. Um, on the financial side, a couple things to highlight. Um, we just learned uh, about a week and a half ago that we've received uh, an award from the Government Finance Officers Association that we have received the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for our 2019 Comprehensive Financial Report. Uh, believe it or not, this is our 31st consecutive award for our Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, um, which is truly a remarkable string of, of, uh, of accomplishments. And if, if you were to visit the, the conference room here at the administration building, you'd see a line of plaques across the wall in the, in the conference room. Uh, the, the financial team, Jerry and Lori Fox and her group, they are just bringing in the hardware every year. And it's quite a, quite a thing. Um, so congratulations to them and their staff uh, for another strong year. Um, speaking of the audit, we just had our entrance conference for the 2020 annual audit. And I want to thank uh, board chair Daughtry and board member Schwetty and labor representative Norton for attending that. Uh, the state auditor staff convened us uh, with the board members and our award-winning financial team uh, to go over the process for the upcoming audit. And uh, we expect a exit conference on that uh, late summer, mid, mid to late summer. So that process will be going forward and we'll keep you posted. Uh, in addition to uh, what you heard earlier from Melissa related to uh, federal funding, um, we've also received news that we are being allocated 35.4 million uh, through the PSRC of uh, Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, the CRISA funding. Uh, so that issue has been uh, resolved and um, our allocation has been uh, presented. Uh, we are expecting yet another uh, allocation of COVID relief funding through the American Recovery Plan. Uh, that process is, is starting up again through PSRC and I expect we'll have uh, additional higher level conversations about those allocations as we did with the CRISA funding. Um, so I'll keep you posted on that, but I would expect you'll 
you'll hear more. It was it was a robustly debated issue, um, as many of you know, and uh, I'm happy with the way it turned out with our allocation uh, and with the region committing to retaining the earned share formula as the basis for distributing those funds. Um, looking beyond the recovery plan, um, the Biden administra administration uh, has also submitted uh, an infrastructure package. And I'm sure everybody's heard a little bit about this, but it really um, sustains the potential federal investment in transit and is likely to be a, a fairly high profile um, focus of discussion back in Washington, D.C. over the course of the summer and into the fall. Uh, we were encouraged by members of our congressional delegation to submit project proposals uh, as part of that process. And so we submitted to Representative Larson's office a request for funding to support the gold line and a request to uh, Representative Del Benny's office uh, to support uh, the improvements to the ride store in Linwood uh, in time for the Linwood Transit Center to become the light rail terminus. So I wanna thank Mayor Smith and Mayor Nearing and Council Member Schwede for their letters of support for those, for those proposals. And we will engage with our delegation and, and, uh, and uh, keep you informed of, of that process as it goes forward over the course of the summer. Um, in terms of our own internal budget and financial processes, um, it's May and we're now working on a mid-year uh, budget amendment. Um, we have talked to you a few times at the committee level and the board level about sales tax and about some mid-year needs with respect to staffing and capital facilities. So we'll be bringing forward a, a budget amendment through the committees to the board meeting next month for consideration and possible action. Um, and then we'll be getting kicked off uh, shortly thereafter or around the same time actually internally on our 2022 budget process. Uh, Roland and his team, meantime, are beginning the process of developing our transit development plan update. Um, and that will go through the usual process of, of internal development and review the next couple of months, and then board and public review and input through the late summer and early fall. Um, there's going to be a lot of thoughtful activity. Uh, we expect to go into that. That's where we will start to uh, uh, frame our approach to some of the issues we discussed at the workshop uh, a couple of weeks ago in terms of uh, investigating uh, the potential transition of, of our fleet composition to, to incorporate uh, electric vehicles, uh, look at seeing through our facility master plan and supporting some of our innovative uh, service concepts that we're working on. So that's going to be exciting. Um, last but not least, just to touch on a couple of external items, um, I'm continuing to meet with external partners all the time. Uh, last week, we had the Bothell State of the City event uh, meeting tomorrow with Gary Clark. We've set up monthly meetings uh, to coordinate and just touch base between uh, CT and, and the Economic Alliance. Um, I want to thank uh, Board Member Merrill for hosting us on our visit to Snohomish uh, last month. Uh, I think I might have mentioned that to some of you. We got a chance, I think, to have the first official business meeting in the newly restored Carnegie Library. So that was quite a treat uh, for, for Roland and, and I. Um, and then next up uh, in June, I'll be uh, visiting with Mayor Nearing and his team in Marysville. Last but not least, May is Bike to Work Month. So I couldn't let the report go by without highlighting that CT has uh, somewhere around 20 employees signed up to participate in Bike to Work Month. And I've joined one of those two teams. Um, I'm excited because it gives me an opportunity to, to get out there and get a little exercise and continue to experience our, our service as a customer uh, and meet, uh, meet employees along the way. I rode in this morning. I got in a 10 mile ride from Ballard to Aurora Village Transit Center. And um, uh, met Ann, the coach operator there for the second time. So I'm starting to see some of, some of the operators the second time through. Um, and I, I just sort of spontaneously took a picture of my bike on the bike rack in the vehicle and decided to tweet it. I'm kind of a novice Twitter person. And so I tweeted this. And by the time I got back to the office, I realized the picture had been retweeted by the Seattle Times 
transportation reporter. And he was, he was comparing our bike racks favorably to those of Metro. So in addition to getting a little exercise, I also managed some inadvertent branding for CT as well. So Mr. Chair, that, uh, that concludes my report. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Fritz. Um, does anybody have any questions for the CEO? Personally, I stay away from Twitter, uh, Facebook, and everything else that has any antisocial context to it. I mean, social context to it. Um, anybody? Anybody? More crickets? Okay, good. We will move on then to our committee reports. Finance Performance and Oversight Committee Council Member Schwedy. Okay, thank you. I don't know, but I think at the next board meeting, I'd like to see a photo of that bike. If you could somehow send that to us. <laughs> uh, anyway, the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee met on Thursday, April 15th, 2021 via Zoom agency staff and board members, Jared Mead, Tom Merrill, Sid Roberts, and I attended. It was like the fastest finance committee meeting I've been in. On the consent agenda is approval of March 2021 expenditures and payroll items D through eight, H. And on reports, the March 2021 sales tax report, community transit, collected approximately 12.7 million in sales tax, approximately 4.2 million more than budgeted. This is for purchases made in January. This is 8.5% more than the sales tax revenue collected in March of 2020. The diesel fuel report, year to date community transit paid an average of $1.87 per gallon for diesel fuel compared to the 2021 budgeted amount of $1.75 per gallon. A mid-year budget amendment will be presented to the board in June and will include an increase to the diesel fuel budget. The budget team continues to closely monitor fuel costs. The next Finance Performance and Oversight Committee meeting is scheduled at 2 p.m. Thursday, May 20th, 2021 via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, I appreciate it. And next is the Str Strategic Alignment Capital Development Committee, um, Council Member Marine. Hey, thank you, Chair. The Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee was held remotely over Zoom on Wednesday, April 21st at 2 p.m. The meeting was attended by myself, Council Member Tom Merrill, Labor Representative Lance Norton, and Mayor Nicholas Smith. The committee reviewed and forwarded one item on today's consent agenda, and that is the disposal of the land mobile radio system. This item is for approval of the decommissioning and disposable equipment and related infrastructure from the land mobile radio system that has been successfully replaced with the voice over internet protocol system. The committee was briefed on two informational items presented earlier in today's meeting. That's the agency wireless program and the SWIFT VRT program. The next meeting uh, of the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee was moved from Wednesday, May 19th to Wednesday, May 26th at 2 p.m. And that is all I have here. Thank you, Joe. Does anybody have any questions for either Jan Schwede or Joe Marine on their committee reports? Seeing none, we will move on to this consent agenda. I would entertain a motion. I'll move approval of consent, John Nearing. So I have a motion by John Marine, John Marine and, <laughs> and Joe Nearing. <laughs> it's a second. Okay, uh, why don't you guys continue on without me and we'll be fine. <laughs> okay, a first by John and a second by Joe. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any abstain or, okay, pass unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, what's in this coffee cup? Yeah. Um, Next is the chair's report. Um, I don't really have much. I don't know if the rest of the board members receive any uh, correspondence from the APTA Transit Board Members Legis Legislative Subcommittee. Anybody? Okay, somehow I ended up on this committee. I, I don't understand how it happened. I'm getting emails from them and I went ahead and took time and went to a board meeting. 
um, for the legislative subcommittee. Um, I'll just give you a brief update of what's going on with them. Uh, they, re they gave out a report of how many billions of dollars in emergency relief funds have gone to transit agencies throughout the United States, and it is $69.5 billion. Um, so that was the one thing that really popped up in my mind. I also think they were wondering who I was too, but they gave me the invite, so I went. Um, they're doing something called a virtual legislative fly-in. They do a legislative fly-in every year. This one's on May 19th, and this year it's, it's virtual. And they're advocating for transit, focusing on eight different states, mostly in the Southeast and a little bit of the Northeast. Um, and then uh, and what they're doing is they're putting teams together from uh, electeds on their boards through the transit agencies and, and uh, board members that are what they call a business member. So they're putting them together in teams and going to the fly in and advocating for those, those eight systems. So that's what's going on with them. I will continue to report out if, if I continue to go, I'm not really sure. They haven't reached out to me and I kind of figured they were like, who are you? You know, that kind of thing. But um, that's about all I have on that. Um, sad news. Uh, I think everybody understands the sad news we got and um, appreciate uh, Rick bringing that to our attention. I uh, will hold their thoughts and prayers. And um, that's about all I have. So from then we'll go on to the action items. Uh, and I believe that is Roland going to bring us a presentation. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, board members. I'm speaking to action on resolution 05-21. Uh, the resolution and an accompanying memorandum should be in your board materials. And as the board will recall from previous briefings, community transit operating bases are currently at or exceeding capacity for vehicle parking, storage, and operational needs. The uh, board will recall that um, you approved a new project in December of 2020 to seek additional land for the intended use of vehicle storage and to provide sufficient space for training activities. We, in the intervening time, have been working with local brokers. Staff have reviewed multiple properties throughout Snohomish County. And as we shared with the board last month in executive session, a preferred site in close proximity to current operating bases was identified and reviewed for suitability um, for our needs. An offer was tendered for the preferred site and has been accepted by the seller. And the seller has provided a draft purchase and sale agreement, uh, which is currently under legal review. Adoption of resolution 05-21 will give the chief executive officer authority to sign the final purchase and sale agreement and any other documents needed to conclude the purchase of the property once we have concluded with negotiations. We're recommending that the board of directors adopt resolution number 05-21, authorizing the purchase of additional property to support expanded operations, vehicle parking, increased training needs and future fleet infrastructure. And with that, I'll hand it back to the chair. Thank you, Roland. Does anybody have any questions for Roland, Roland on 05? I lost the number, sorry. 0521. Mr. Chair, this is Lance Norton. I have some questions. Go ahead, Lance. Thank you. Roland, I, three weeks ago, on Wednesday, April 14th, I don't know how many people saw this, but it was in the Seattle Times on page A11, which is the Northwest section, in a large headline, and it said, Boeing to spend millions cleaning pollution near the Everett plant, state proposal says. And then it does an article <clears throat> under that headline by the Associated Press. I could read that article, and probably I will end up reading it aloud. It's not all that long. But before I, I read it, I have some questions. Has, have you, Roland, and others within Community Transit, did you see that article? We did. Okay. And from what I understand, the property we're looking at as I recall, was four acres of which two of those acres were usable and two were not. 
I also understand that these four acres that we're going to possibly purchase in excess of $3 million is within ear shot or voice shot, if you will, of, um, of, the, of the Boeing property on Casino Road. Is that correct? I might, I might recommend um, to the chair you know, that we are in negotiations on the um, on the property, and the if there is a if there is a desire by board members to have a um, a more detailed conversation, we might consider the parameters of the executive session recommendation. And I believe Lance, uh, Lance, I think that. Uh, your question does fall under the uh, guidance of having to go into an executive session. So um, I believe that we need to do that. And in order to do that, we would leave this session and go into the executive session that is on your uh, agenda. Um, uh, so I believe that we do need an executive session. So I would say that we need to adjourn into executive session in order to answer your questions, Lance. Thank you. Jim, I appreciate that, and I'm willing to certainly acquiesce to whatever you decide we should do. All right, so with that, uh, everybody needs to leave this session, and when we're done with the executive uh, section, we would come back. How many, uh, Roland, how long do you think we would be in this executive session to answer that question and any others? What would you, what would you like? I think, I guess the, um, I don't think that we need long to answer questions. And I'll just, I would just wanted to clarify for purposes of the board that we can, uh, the, the concern is we, we would want to um, answer any detailed questions about the particular site in executive session. Um, I can also provide assurances that the, you know, the particular question being asked if there are concerns about the issues that the Seattle Times article raised, we do not have concerns in that regard. But um, the direction of questioning was going to be getting into locational issues, and that's where I wanted to answer questions uh, within the executive session framework. So I'm, I'm thinking uh, 10 minutes. All right, and I'm going to ask Mr. Hendricks to uh, lend us his expertise on this. Mr. Hendricks, uh, yes. is this worthy of going into executive session, and do we need to do that? Yeah, I would put it into executive session for... Um, I was thinking about five minutes and then we can extend. That seems All reasonable. All right, then hearing those uh, comments, I will uh, adjourn us into executive session. We will wait until everybody is there before we start the clock. We will be in executive session for five minutes. Mr. Hendricks will come in and extend that if necessary. And uh, then we'll come back in and continue with the action item. So I will see you all in executive session. <laughs> While we're waiting, Alan, I just want to tell you you've got the wrong ferry there behind you. <laughs> yeah. That's the Edmonds Ferry. I, I know. <laughs> the newest one in the fleet is, yeah, is in Muckleteo. This is Lance back at the regular meeting. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Kim. Okay, who am I missing here? I'm missing... Oh, Jared's here. Uh, I think. Nicola had to leave, is that correct? Or no, that was Jan. I'm here. Okay, there you are, thank you. I just, just now saw you. It looks like everyone's here, Chair. I just took roll. Everyone okay. you're expecting. I believe you're correct. And have we reached the five minutes for the last executive session extension? Yes. We did. Right. Thank you, Al. Um, we are back in session. The uh, action item on the table is resolution 521. Are there any other questions for either June or Roland? I would like, before we act on the motion. I'd like to just make a comment about the executive session. Go ahead, Alan. About a 10 minute delay in the beginning of the executive session. I want to put that on the record 
that during that 10 minute delay, there was no uh, business discussion or discussion by anybody that was in that executive session, except for the beginning of the executive session, which was delayed for about 10 minutes because there were some technical difficulties. I wanna make sure that there's no complaint later on that uh, there was a discussion during that period of time. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Alan. Really appreciate that. Uh, as I said before, are there any other questions or comments? And if not, I would entertain a motion for the action item. Chair, <clears throat> I move that the board of directors adopt resolution number 0521, authorizing the purchase of additional property to support expanded operations, vehicle parking, increased training needs, and a future fleet infrastructure. Second. All right, it's been first and second in motion from Sid Roberts and Joe Marine. Are there any uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It's passed unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, next, uh, I've got to get back to my notes here that I lost during the, oh, it's in the other session. That's what happened. Okay. <laughs> um, that is, holy cow, where did I put it? Okay. Uh, Poor our chair's report. I already did the chair's report. Sorry about that. Uh, board of communications. Anybody else want to have anything for the board? No, nope, seeing none. Oh, Noah. Uh, yeah, I do. I just uh, wanted to share that just before this meeting, I ended a two-hour meeting with a Sound Transit committee meeting. And uh, one of the motions that we made at that sound transit um, committee meeting was um, authorizing the chief executive officer to execute an agreement with community transit for the operation of ST express service operations and maintenance through December, 2025. Um, and what it was significant for me with this was the comments that the, the sound transit staff made with regard to the collaboration and the professionalism that the community transit staff um, offered them. So just wanted to give a shout out and uh, say thanks for maintaining the collaborative and professional um, work that, that you do, that's all. Thank you, Mayor Smith. Very good. Anybody else? All right, I don't think we have an executive session needed anymore. And uh, is there any other for the good of the order or the good of the organization? Seeing none, I would read, I would uh, entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Great. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next month. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. I appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. So long, Lance.